Good morning, how's everybody doing? Sorry, we're running about 10-ish, 15 minutes late. I'm sorry, we're getting, getting, getting started a little bit late, but I was told that I have till one, so everybody knows we've all been pushed back 15 minutes. So thank you guys very much for this time and this opportunity to, to chat with you. My name is Jeff Woolsey. I'm a principal program manager in Microsoft. I work in the Windows Server sort of the world. Um, I've been working on a variety of things. Uh, most notably, I've been working on virtualization now for over the last 16 years. Um, some of it is small startup, last almost 14 of it at Microsoft, um, uh, look at working on Hyper-V, hypervisors, virtualization, but now I look uh, across the entire server platform, I look at storage, I look at networking, I look at compute, I look at the uh, app dev side of the world, so I'm looking very broadly across uh, what's going on there. It's really a pleasure to be here to talk to you today about reinventing agility and productivity. Um, if you saw the keynote, I, I was able to do the, uh, uh, the demo today doing a bunch of things in hybrid in Azure, which was great, um, kind of kicked off some of the things we're doing in Azure. Um, I only get a few minutes to do those demos up there, so now I wanna be able to drill in deeper to really explain to everybody very clearly um, what's going on behind the covers, behind the scenes, what's going on below Azure, and really how we think about cloud at Microsoft, and really dovetail that with what you guys are doing in your IT, in your organization, on premises, and how we think about hybrid in this whole spectrum of cloud. All right? So, first thing I want to talk about is over the last few years, as we've been working on cloud, especially over the last year in the, this latest release and the latest, the 2016 wave of releases, spent a lot of time talking to customers. And I find that it's very interesting when I share this back with folks because I see a lot of people tend to go, oh, good, I'm not the only one that feels this way. So IT concerns that we've heard literally from customers around the world. Number one, Jeff, there are too many stories about companies getting hacked and not knowing about it for months. Oh my goodness, yes. Okay, you, you don't even need to look at companies, look at our political landscape going on right now, and the, the whole notion of hacking is pretty much top of mind. But even before that, I mean, it seems like every day I, I go to a website and web, oh, just read the news and gosh, which company has been hacked today and whose leaks are going out? Uh, whether it's retail, whether it's entertainment, whether it's media, everybody is being uh, is under siege. Another question, how can we get the benefits of public cloud in our data centers? Yeah, I'll tell you very often, someone comes to me and goes, Jeff, I went up to Azure and I see that I can get gigabytes and terabytes of ridiculously high performance, fault tolerant storage for like pennies. Where do I get that? Well, I want, I want some of that please. Can I start running some of that on premises? How can I take advantage of what you're doing in the public cloud on premises? Um, what do I do about shadow IT? This something comes up over and over again. I'm really worried because you know what, I've been working on building IT and I just found out that those developers over there have, built, have, have spent a ton of money and guess what, it's none of this is on, on infrastructure we built. And they're doing it out on some public cloud. How do we manage it? How do we even know it's there? Who approved this? What's going on? Another thing, I'm worried about the wrong, building the wrong thing. We spent years building virtualized data centers that don't look like any cloud. And I'm hearing this one a lot more and more every single day, which is, you know, by the way, I was, I was there at the dawn of virtualization, been working on, well, I should say at the dawn of x86 virtualization, because virtualization goes about decades. By the way, spoiler alert for those that don't know it, virtualization is a really old technology. Don't let anybody tell you it's brand new and it was just invented 10 years ago. Um, one of our core architects who helped devise Hyper-V actually wrote the first three hypervisors on Amdahl in the late 60s. So I laugh at these people say, well, hypervisors are brand new. And I remember talking with this architect and he goes, Jeff, this is, we've been doing this for decades. The only thing that changes, I'm not doing this on Amdahl, I'm doing this on x86. Okay, so, but this point is, I'm worried about building the wrong thing. We've been doing virtualization now and turns out our virtualization and companies that are in similar industries as me, are doing virtualization, these don't look alike. And then when we go look at what's going on in the cloud, it doesn't look like any, anything like that. So are we building snowflakes? How are we building something that actually looks consistent with what's going on in the public cloud? And then finally, when I ask folks, folks, simple question to you. This is a question you should ask yourself, which is where do you wanna be? Where does your organization wanna be in three years, five years, 10 years? Are you, are, you, are you ready to tell me that 10 years from now, everything that you have will be running on premises? Really? Three years from now? 
Are you completely opposite? Are some of you already 100% in the public cloud? Most people I talk to say, look, Jeff, I, I, I'm, there are some people that are all public. There are some people that are all private. Everybody I talk to says, no, 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 it's hybrid. The question where is, where is that slider? Are you going to be, tend to be more public and still have a few things on premises? Are you going to be more on premises and have a few things in public? That's up to you. The, goal, the thing that we found out is everybody wants hybrid. You know, I've talked to customers who say, Jeff, I, I don't care how great Azure is. There is something here. I have some workloads here that are never going to run anywhere but in a data center because reasons. Okay, the CTO that built, the COO, the CEO that built this company said, if I ever can't walk into the data center and touch this server, you're all fired. Okay, fine, keep running it on premises. I don't care what the reason. The point is everybody has told us very loudly, hybrid is where they want to go. And I'll explain to this in, in detail. Why is cloud moving so quickly? One word, it's agility. I remember a few years ago when we started talking about cloud, very early in cloud, people would come to us and say, Microsoft, why, why are people moving to cloud? Amazon, why are people moving to cloud? And I think, honestly, when, as an industry, we don't know the answer. We all say it'll be cheaper. When we literally don't know. We were still trying to figure it out. We all said it'll be cheaper. And you know what? Cost is a component. And yeah, it, it can be radically cheaper. That's not why people are moving to cloud. The reason why people are moving to cloud is agility. If you want to set up worldwide streaming services today, right now, we're ready to go. You go, just go to Azure, we'll, we'll help you out. If you need to set up a branch office brand new, if you need to set up Office 365 new, if you need to set up Hadoop infrastructure, yeah, you can go buy racks and racks of servers and storage and network and compute and spend the next year or two trying to set it up, configure it, and build it, and run. You can absolutely do all that. Or you can go up to Azure and a couple clicks are ready to go. That agility is critical. It's about getting to market fast. It's about getting to market quickly. And it's why, in many cases, startups are going, going, getting so quickly because they don't actually have any, you know, they're brand new. They're IT. They're starting in the cloud, and they're like, well, I got media services. I got CDN. I got Hadoop. I got security. I got worldwide replication. I got all these things. Great. All the tools are ready to go. Let's go. And so people are realizing agility is why people are moving to the cloud. Now, when we talk about the cloud, I actually like to explain the cloud in a very specific way. I think, I think I'm one of the few at Microsoft that explains it this precisely. When we talk about cloud at Microsoft, quite honestly, we think about it as three legs to a stool, okay? And it starts quite, quite literally with private. I shouldn't even say private anymore because I really don't, I've never liked the word private. On-premises, okay? And today that's Windows Server and System Center. But honestly, forget the technology for a second. I don't even care about the technology. Private. I can describe private cloud or on-premises cloud in one word. That word is control. I speak to customers around the world that say, Jeff, I have a workload that has to run in a German data center on German, on German soil by German citizens. Are you going to try and push me up into Azure? No. If you need that level of control, compliance, regulatory, data sovereignty, whatever, fine. Let's go help you build the best on-prem solution out there. By the way, those reasons are going away real quick. You heard Jason mention in the, in the keynote this morning, guess what? We have German data centers now. Guess what? The Germans are thrilled out of their mind. I was in Germany when we made the announcements, and they were like, finally, we are going to Azure in a huge way. This is what we were waiting for. We were waiting, literally, they were waiting for Azure data centers in Germany. Okay, done. And guess what? We've been doing this literally around the world. But I don't care what the reason. For folks that need that level of control, if that's what you need, great. Build a private cloud. At the same time, we're making huge investments in public cloud. And when I talk about Azure, I mean platform as a service, software as a service, and infrastructure as a service. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a virtualization guy. I've been working on virtualization and hypervisors over 16 years. I love VMs. I'm the first one to tell you VMs are the least interesting thing in the public cloud. Everybody focuses on VMs. Honestly, and again, I'm the hypervisor guy, who cares? You want that agility? It's not about VMs. You know what your developers are doing? They're not building new apps and VMs. They're using serverless computing. They're moving to new models and faster because they don't want to deal with the ways of the past. Now, if you need IaaS, you need VMs, great. We got it all up there. I showed you in, in, in the keynote this morning. But people are adopting Office 365. They're adopting SQL and databases and all that real simple because it's much faster. And I'll give you a perfect example. Here is the difference between IaaS, VMs, and PaaS. 
Let me explain it real simply, because I think we talk about this and people don't really get the difference. Here's the difference. Let's say I need to set up a database. I don't care what the database is. I'm gonna put it in a VM. What do I do? I create a VM. I install the operating system. I patch the operating system. I install the database. I create my tables. I then patch the OS, patch the database, back it up, rinse and repeat, monitor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, till the end of time. That's what a VM is. Just like we've been doing this for decades now. Here's what a database is in PaaS. You go to Azure, you say, I want a database, and you upload your database. We're all done. Patching, we do that for you. Back it up, we do that for you. You need to focus on your database, great. Tell your developers, focus on the database. There's no upkeep and maintenance and monitoring and patching, all of that stuff that you used to do in the VM. That's the difference between PaaS and IaaS. Guess what? People that have figured it out are going, oh my gosh, this is so much faster. So we're investing in all of these. PaaS, SaaS, IaaS, you name it, it's all there. I can describe the public cloud in one word, scale. And by scale, I mean, if you need to build an application that literally spans the world, guess what, we can do that. If any of you watched, I don't know, the Rio Olympics, the Sochi Olympics, all that's been delivered on Azure for the past many Olympics now. Worldwide, over 100 million uh, customers, 22 countries, five continents around the world flawlessly in HD. All coming from Azure. Also, we have service providers. Every so often, someone says to me, Jeff, I love what you have here, but guess what? I need Azure services in Kenya. Do you have an Azure data center in Kenya? Unfortunately, I don't. We have 38 regions around the world. We have the most by far, but there are plenty of countries where we simply don't have a presence. Folks, we have service providers that are happy to do that for you. They provide customization and reach. They can provide those locations where we don't exist. Also, if you need special SLAs, every so often I have someone come to me with a very weird request. Jeff, I wanna take a workload and I wanna put it in a specific data center, in a specific rack, in a specific location. Can I do that in Azure? And unfortunately, my answer is no. And the reason why is real simple. When we deploy new hardware in Azure, it's called a stamp. A stamp is roughly 1,000 servers. I didn't say racks, I didn't say single servers, it's literally 1,000 servers. So when someone says, I want to get to a single server, we simply don't think that small. We can't, we can't do that. So if you need that, guess what? We have ha partners that are happy to do that. The reason why I talk about this and explain it in this level is because when we talk about cloud, it's very specific. And what's important to us is the consistency around all of this. This is the magic that is hybrid. When you talk to some vendors who say cloud, they'll say, oh no, Jeff, cloud is only this. You talk to other vendors, they'll tell you, for example, Amazon, no, no, cloud is this. Well, what if I need to run it on-premises? Mm, sorry, we don't do on-prem. Our answer isn't that. Our answer is real simple. Do you want to run here? Great, please do that. Do you want to run here? Great, please do that. Do you want to run here? Great, please do that. If you're like 95% of the people you talk, we talk to, you want this so bad you can taste it. You want all of it. I want to be able to say, Jeff, I have stuff to here that's running today. But new workloads that I'm using, why wouldn't I just start them here? And by the way, if I do build something here, maybe I'm gonna move it up here in a year. And guess what, what if I need to move it back? You can do that too. See, when we talk about consistency and hybrid, it means so much to us. It means I can build apps here and deploy them here. I can build apps here and deploy them there. So, what we've done over the last, what's been interesting is we had this thing called Azure Pack. Azure Pack is free software. It's actually one of the hottest downloads we've had for the last couple of years. But it was, what we learned was, and it plugged into Windows Server and System Center, and what it did was we took the Azure UI, and we said you can have it for free. And so could, people could build their own on-premises private clouds, and it actually had not only VMs, but it had PaaS services, like PaaS databases and PaaS websites. Guess what? Customers loved it. 
They ate it like candy. They said, Jeff, this is amazing. This is what we're looking for. Because this looks very similar to this. This is great. However, there was one huge, very important learning that we got back from this, which was people came to us and said, Jeff, I just realized something about Azure Pack. Azure Pack is Azure similar. It looks like Azure, but it's really not Azure. It's Azure-like. It's Azure similar. I want Azure the same, like literally the same. And what I mean by that is, if you wrote to a storage API for Azure Pack, it was different than a storage API on real Azure. So you know what we did? We said, guess what? You're right. That's what Azure Stack is all about. Azure Stack is about bringing Azure to your data center. If you're writing applications, you literally write to Azure APIs that are the same. Guess what? Developers are out of their mind excited. Because today, if I want to run on premises or if I want to run in Amazon, for example, that's two different worlds. Before you do anything, your, your developers got to sit down and go, okay, if I'm running this on premises, my resources are going to look like X, Y, and Z. And in Amazon, they could look totally different. And, or depending on where I decide to, to run this, could look totally different. In this world, we say, no, folks. We have this thing called the Azure Resource Model, or ARM. Developers, just write to ARM. In fact, you can do it right now. Write your applications for Azure right now. Just do it for the ARM, ARM resource model. Those applications can also run on premises. So now you can develop up here and deploy here. You can also develop here and deploy here. And if you need to move it back and forth, or if you want to take an application and stretch it and take advantage of the best of both, you can. I've been asked about this many times. Jeff, I want to have the database on premises but I want to have my CDN, my replication, my front end up in the Azure Public Cloud. Totally can do that too. This is what we mean by consistency. It's not just, hey, we're running a, the same hypervisor in both places. By the way, we are. Hyper-V in Windows Server is the same hypervisor we use in Azure. We are the only global public cloud that gives you the same hypervisor we use on-premises in our public cloud. Google, sorry, there's is private, you can't have it. Amazon, no, nope, sorry, private code again, can't have it. Ours, same code we ship in Windows Server. It's the same hypervisor. It's also the same hypervisor that's in Windows 10 client. It's in Windows Server, it's in Azure Stack, it's also available in Azure. The point here is when we think about cloud, it's truly about this consistency in place. At the end of the day, our goal is real simple. We wanna provide you the best cloud whenever and wherever it makes business sense, period. That's it. When I talk about Azure, by the way, I mentioned this already before, but if you want to talk about VMs, fine. VMs, there's one little thing over here. Okay, big deal. This is why you should be looking at Azure. It's all these other services that are ready to go. You need container services, you need uh, logic apps, you need media services, you need to build cloud services, you need notification hubs, you need Hadoop infrastructure, you need all sorts of different types of databases, whether it's SQL, NoSQL, Redis. These are all available right now. Yeah, VMs are over there, that one little corner thing over there, big deal. Yeah, you can still run all the VMs you want. Red Hat, Linux, Ubuntu, Oracle, Debian, you name it, we support them all. As Jason mentioned today, over a third of our VMs are Linux and rising. Great, we've been supporting Linux forever. Guess what? This is the interesting part, the data analytics, the Hadoop. So, over the last 12 months, over 600 new services and features. Think about that benefit to your organization. Here's the difference, and by the way, I'm the server guy. I'm not even the Azure guy. Think about this for a second. In Windows Server, we just released 2016. I'm incredibly proud of that, and we'll talk more about that in just a second. But in Windows Server, think about this. Over the last few releases, what do we do? Windows Server, we used to release basically a server release every two to three years. Okay, what happens? We release a version, then a few years later we release a new version. We tell you how to upgrade, how to migrate, we give you a bunch of scripts, we train you, we tell you how to get to the next version, and you upgrade, and then you keep doing this upgrade thing. There's a lot of work involved. There's a lot of movement involved. In this, in Azure, it's just handled. 
I've actually had this before where I've done keynotes. I've actually done a few keynotes where one, one of my favorites, when I was doing one for our CEO, Satya Nadella, I went in on a Friday, I was finishing up my keynote, went home, played with the family, had a great time over the weekend, came back in Monday morning, getting ready to do the keynote, logged in, and there were 10 new features there. I was like, oh, guess we pushed some updates into production. That just happens, guess what? I didn't have to migrate any data, I didn't have to, it just all arrived. What it meant for me and everybody in the room is we just gave you new features, we just lit them up, and now you can do things faster and easier and better than ever. We talked about this this morning, so I'm gonna zip right by it, 38 Azure regions, they are ginormous. I also like to point out that remember, a region does not equal a data center. A region at least is two data centers, if not many, many more because we can do failover and redundancy within a region. 1.6 million miles of fiber, express route allows you to privately connect. People say, hey, you know what, Jeff, I've got some latency, very important applications that are latency sensitive. Can I actually get into your data centers? Absolutely, you can do that ex through express route, and we've got a ton of partners that help us do this literally around the world. Now, from a hybrid perspective, I mentioned this before, it's not just VMs. It's actually all sorts of hybrid capabilities. You wanna do replication. You wanna do backup. Guess what? They have things like Azure Site Recovery, hybrid backup and DR. And by the way, our replication not only does Hyper-V, not only does physical machines, but does VMware as well. So we can do all of your replication through Azure Site Recovery, very popular. We can do hybrid apps. You want your apps to actually span your on-premises to the public cloud? Absolutely, again, take advantage of the boast, of the best of both and do what makes sense for you. Hybrid identity, oh my gosh, this is something incredibly important. Azure Active Directory is one of the fastest growing services uh, at, in, in Azure and I've lost track of how many customers. Last time I checked it was over 700 million uh, folks were in Azure Active Directory and that's just growing like crazy. But think about it. You have folks that join your company all the time or your organization, what do you do? You create an account and active directory. You give them access to cloud resources. Hopefully they work for your business, your organization for a long time, but you know what, five years down the road they decide they're moving to another part of the country and you need to shut down and take off their account. Okay, so what cloud resources did they have access to? Are you sure when they left the company that you actually turned off everything and you didn't leave anything running and they don't secretly still have access to something that they can have access to even after they've left the company? With that Azure Active Directory integration, guess what? Not a problem. When you disable that account, it's public, it's private, it's all of those services because we've rationalized all of that through, through AD. And of course, I get to Azure Stack, which I've already mentioned before. Now Azure Stack, I should point out, is not shipping yet. Azure Stack is currently at technical preview too. Um, and the thing I wanna point out is if you look at the left-hand side, which is Azure Stack, that's on-premises, that's running in your data center, or Azure running in our public cloud, you'll notice uh, it's the same. That's my point. Azure Resource Manager, PowerShell, Portal, DevOps tools, cloud-inspired uh, cloud infrastructure, IaaS and PaaS services. That's what makes us different and unique from anything else. Everybody's still looking backwards. Everybody's looking at the last 10 years, figuring out, ooh, what do we need to do more to VMs? That's not what developers are doing. That's not where the, where the industry's going. The industry's moving to SaaS and PaaS layers, which is around agility and making you more, use, more, more efficient use of resources. So that's what we're doing with Azure Stack. Now it's available in technical preview too now, and if you haven't tried it, I urge you to do that. You can download it and start getting your hands on the bits. And spoiler alert, it looks just like Azure. If you saw me using the portal today, if you saw me doing the demo in the keynote, guess what? The portal looks the same. If you don't wanna go through that process, if you just don't wanna deal with that, great. Log into Azure and play with Azure, because guess what? It's gonna look awfully the same. Now, one thing I should point out, I showed you that big, longly list of services on, on the wall. One question I get all the time is, Jeff, are all of those services gonna be available in Azure Stack? Let me set the expectation right now, no. And let me give you a perfect example why. I'll be walking through some of those. And machine learning one is one I like to point out. I've literally been in a room where someone stood up and said, oh my gosh, I would kill to have machine learning in my data center. And I said, really? Yeah, we, we would kill right now, we, we, we'll take it. I said, well, the interesting thing about that is machine learning, minimal deployment is about 700 servers. 
oh, never mind. <laughs> never mind. You keep running that in Azure. But you know what? That begins an interesting part of this conversation. Because what we can now do is we can now look at that list of services that I showed you in the earlier slide, and we can ask. We can figure out which are the ones that are important to you. You don't have to take them all. If you just want web services, you just want some VMs, you just want some express routes, things like that, great. If you come back and say, you know what, I need some of this, I need some replication, something like that, we can have the conversation. We're eager to have that conversation to figure out which are the ones that are most important. And when we get to those ones that are heavy hitters, like machine learning, and everybody goes, never mind, that's okay, at least we're lear we've learned. By the way, I have had one customer that literally stood up and said, I will write the check now and buy the 700 server. So I have had one. Okay, everybody else, no way, it's just too big. So, with that in mind, let's switch on over to the data center. Uh, as I mentioned, in Azure, in Azure Stack, what underlies it? Well, it's underlied by our hypervisor, our software-defined stack, our software-defined storage, our software-defined networking. Gosh, where do those come from? Those come from Windows Server 2016 and what we've been doing in Windows Server. And in this latest release of Windows Server, we've really been focused on three critical areas, really from your feedback. Number one, security. Security is literally top of mind for everyone. And the reason why is really simple. Security threats are now a CEO issue, okay? It used to be the security issue, no, that's Phil's problem. Phil's the director of IT, he handles our security. Phil handles that, it's Phil's problem. Something happens, Phil gets fired. Not anymore. You see, the average uh, attack is now about $5 million. That's now a CEO problem. That's not a Phil problem. Phil can't sign for that. CEOs are now getting fired for this. They're going, well, what did you do to help protect your infrastructure? And how much investment did you do? Were you, were, what were you doing? And by the way, that is growing at a 15% year-over-year uh, compound annual growth rate. So that number is rising. Data center efficiency, what can we do to run our servers more efficiently? And what can we do to support developer innovation, cloud innovation, application innovation? So we're gonna drill into all of these. First, Windows Server and System Center, 2016. Advanced multi-layer security, Azure-inspired software-defined and cloud-ready application platform. And these are available, again, right now. Security, our Windows Server philosophy, very straightforward. Look, we wanna protect, we wanna detect, we want to isolate and we want to respond. And that's constant. And more importantly, we want to do things to really ratchet up the security. And we're doing things in server, quite literally, we have never done before. Um, here's a nice good list of them here. I could spend literally an hour and a half, well, actually many hours, just talking about these, not going any farther. But I figured you wanted to talk about a lot more. So a few things I'm going to point out. Um, if there's any point I want to make is, if you took an existing application that you have today that's running on Windows Server, any previous version of Windows Server, 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, 2012 R2, and just took that application and moved it into 2016, just by doing that, without making any changes to your application, we've made it more secure. Because we have made such critical advancements in the core server itself to protect against threats, malware that hasn't even been written yet. We're actually protecting against classes of bugs that haven't been written yet. We've also done things to make the OS an active part of your security posture. Things like anti-malware baked in. This is something we've had in client for the longest time. We haven't built it in a server, and we've always said, look, if you want to use it, there's plenty of third parties and enterprise solutions out there. But we've had so many people come back to us and say, say Jeff, when I deploy a server, I have to have antivirus. I have to have anti-malware. It's literally a requirement for me to deploy it. So would you please include it in the box? And if I need something stronger, I'll pay for it. But it's in the box now. Code integrity, Windows Defender, Hyper-V containers. I'll talk more about containers and what those mean. Nano Server, which is a new minimal deployment option for Windows Server. I'll explain that in a little bit. But the one I'm gonna start off with is shielded virtual machines. I have to, this one's near and dear to my heart. As I mentioned before, I've been working on virtualization a long time, and I'll be the first one to tell you, virtualization is fantastic. It's awesome. It's allowed us to do some amazing things. 
allowed us to live migrate, vMotion, live storage migration, all those cool things that allow me to take down the server um, and not impact anything by moving those workloads around. It's allowed me to do things around availability, resiliency, all of that. I'm also the first one to tell you virtualization is far from perfect. I'm also gonna say something extremely controversial now. This is the virtualization guy saying this. Um, virtualization actually creates two problems. <gasps> what? That's heresy. What? No, virtualization's perfect. It's never created any problems. Baloney. I've been saying this since 2003. You can probably find some of my videos online to talk about this. Virtualization actually creates two problems. The first one, single point of failure. Long, long ago in a dark, dark world before virtualization, what did we used to do? We used to put a single workload on a single server. So for example, I put my database on a server, and if that server goes down, power, whatever the reason is, motherboard dies, power, patching, whatever the reason is. If it goes down, yeah, it's bad. A single workload down, went down, but it's one workload, okay? If this is now a virtualization server and it's running 50 VMs and it goes down, that's not just bad, that's catastrophic. Well, the good news is we pretty much solved that. That's why we have things like built-in HA, load balancing, live migration, storage migration, so you can do all of these things and, and service the underlying hardware without any downtime. Good job on the first one. Second one, single point of attack. No one has done jack squat about this one. Yeah, I said that. It's that bad. If the bad guy could get into a single server, yeah, I got a single workload. Yeah, that was bad. It's my database and it had credit card information, that's really bad. If a bad guy can get into your virtualization host, oh, you're toast. I can literally take it, walk out the door, you don't even know. If I get your domain controller, your org is gone. I own the keys to your kingdom. What, this is crazy, no one's ever said this before. Shh. No, this has been quite well known for a long time. We've always said, look, we protect, you know, we provide you the ability to run multiple VMs, but we don't do anything to protect against your underlying admins, your fabric admins, your host admin for your compute, your storage admins, or your network admins. So we are introducing shielded virtual machines. And I can tell you right now, people know about this. Every year, um, I meet with a bunch of agencies, let's just say around the world, a lot of them acronyms, and we go through common criteria, which is an extremely rigorous security process where we look at our code, our processes, our people, our practices. And one of the questions I get pretty much every year is, hey Jeff, what have you guys done about the rogue admin problem? And I go, yeah, we know about this. It's been a problem since, oh, I don't know, the dawn of computing. It's a really hard problem. And every year I say, yeah, we know about it. We're trying to figure out a solution. This year when they came and they said, what are you doing about it? I said, I got something to show you guys. It's called shielded virtual machines. Shielded virtual machines for the first time protect against the fabric admin. Full stop. I want you to let that sink in for a second. That's your hypervisor admin. That's your SAN and storage admin. And that's your network admin. Any one of those guys can get your stuff. Just ask Edward Snowden. And you may be thinking, oh, Jeff, that's a, that's a crazy one. That never happens. Okay, ask the city of San Francisco. <laughs> oh, a couple guys know what I'm talking about. City of San Francisco, the guy who ran their, I don't know if it was a network admin or if it was the overall IT admin, had a little disagreement and said, fine, I quit. By the way, took all the passwords and left. San Francisco, sorry, you can't have access to your own network. They had to put him in jail to get the password so that they could actually get back into their own network. It happens, it's unfortunate, but it happens. Shielded VMs are designed to protect VMs from admin. They're designed to protect VMs that are encrypted at rest and in transit, I mean during live migration. And they're, they're actually trusted virtualization through attestation and measurement. Rather than then explain through a whole bunch of slides, let me actually show you. So, let me switch on over here. Perfect. First thing I'm gonna show you is I'm the bad guy now. And I could be either an internal admin that realized I just had a bad performance review and I'm about to get fired, and so I'm about to take some things with me, or more likely I'm someone on the outside who got credentials 
and have now worked my way up, and now I can log in to your SAN. Well, guess what? You've been virtualizing everything. I can find the keys to your kingdom real easily. Let me show you. Again, I'm logged in as full admin. I'm gonna log into your SAN. I'm gonna go in here to, mm, let's go to your virtual disks. I got VHDs for Hyper-V, I got VMDKs for the other guys. I'm gonna double click on VHDs. Well, looky here, Active Directory Domain Controller 1, Domain Controller 2. I'm gonna double click on Domain Controller 1. Woo, that was a really hard attack. You notice it happened so quickly, I just attacked your server. Yep, guess what? I'm gonna go into this, the ntds.folder. The ntds.folder and the ntds.dit, this is your uh, Active Directory domain controller. This is the keys to your kingdom. This is all of the secrets. So what am I gonna do? Uh, I'm gonna copy this little guy. I am going to put it on my USB stick. I'm going to paste this and I'm gonna take it home. You have no idea, by the way, that I even took this. I now have this on my USB stick. I'm gonna take it home and I'm gonna brute force attack this for the next, I don't know, few months. Eventually, what am I gonna get? I'm gonna get a password dump file that looks something like this. It's gonna have usernames and passwords. At this point, I own your organization. I don't care who you are because I can be anyone in your organization. I can be your CEO. I can be your CTO. I can be your director of IT. I can be anybody I want. I can now walk freely anywhere inside your organization, get all the secrets I want, and you will never find me. Good grief. You kidding me? Yeah, it's that easy. Now, by the way, I'm not pointing out, I'm not saying there's a flaw in Active Directory. No, no, I'm pointing out that we, we basically give complete uh, access to these full admins, because that's the way computers work. Well, we actually want to change that with shielded virtual machines. Let me show you. You can see here, I'm in System Center right now, I've got two virtual machines. In fact, I've got one that's shielded. My Active Directory Domain Controller 2, turns out I shielded that one. I forgot to shield Active Directory Domain Controller 1. That was the one that allowed me to double click on it, mount the virtual disk, and grab the secrets. So what I really want to do is, I want to shield this. Again, very complex. I am going to select it and click on the shield button. At this point, I'm going to add the shielding data. Now at this point you may be thinking, what's shielding data? Shielding data is an encrypted lump of secrets created by the administrator of the guest OS. Not the host admin, not the network admin, not the storage admin. With shielded VMs, the admin of the guest OS is the person in control. That's who actually owns their VM. So at this point, I would import this shielding data. This is, again, an encrypted lump of secrets including the name and password of the administrator for the guest, as well as a list of fabrics that these virtual machines can run on. With a shielded virtual machine, for example, if I'm running in Contoso, that a shielded VM can only run on Contoso fabric. If I'm a full admin, copy it to USB stick, take it home, run it on my hypervisor, doesn't work. It'll say, sorry, this machine isn't part of the Contoso fabric. You see, nothing today does this. Today, once you have a virtual machine, it does nothing to actually check the underlying infrastructure. There is nothing that attests to the physical fabric until now. With shielded VMs, we actually say, no, no, this is actually really the Contoso fabric. This server actually checks out. And I'll explain more about this in a minute. So with the shielding data, we actually apply this to the VM and encrypt it. And while that happens, and that'll take a few minutes, I'm gonna go back on over here, and we're gonna perform that same attack. This time, we're gonna do this with Domain Controller 2, the one that I've already shielded. Watch this, folks. Again, I'm gonna perform the same complex attack. I'm gonna double click on it. And what happens, it says, mm, sorry, this drive is BitLocker protected. Okay, well, let's try something different. Let's scroll up here, let's go up here. And in fact, there's the drive right there, local disk F. You can see it's got the little padlock. All right, let me double click on that. Nope, 
gives me another error. Sorry, there are no supported protectors on this drive. The drive can't be unlocked. What it's telling me is, sorry, I can't decrypt the key to decrypt the virtual disk. So even though I'm logged in as full admin, sorry, that VM is protected. I still can't get to it. All righty, let's try something else. How about we bypass that completely and let's go into Hyper-V. Now, if you've used Hyper-V and Hyper-V Manager, you know, of course, that when we have VMs running, we have a little thumbnail down here. So I can double click on a thumbnail and it brings it up. Um, guess what happens when I'm running a shielded VM? Well, sorry, there's no thumbnail down there. And in fact, by the way, if I try and double click upon it, it says, sorry, you cannot connect to a shielded virtual machine using a virtual machine connection. You have to use remote desktop connection. Why is that? Because to RDP into a shielded virtual machine, we actually have to, we require, you're gonna need the RDP certificate. So we've actually locked that door as well. You can't spoof it. This ensures that when I'm RDPing into a VM, it's actually the VM that I encrypted and it's the one I deployed. So think about what you've seen here. We have completely encrypted this end to end. Let me give you a few more interesting things notes about shielded virtual machines. Each shielded virtual machine has its own unique key. So everyone goes, well, can I just get the key to one and get to them all? Nope, sorry. Every one of them is unique. A shielded virtual machine has a virtual TPM. It is completely a software construct. It has nothing to do with the hardware, okay? We do this so that we can actually uh, apply our, actually seal the key um, inside of the guest OS. But it has nothing to do with the physical hardware because we want to be able to live migrate. And by the way, you can still live migrate your VMs. You can still storage migrate VMs. All of that works. But the important thing to understand is it only works on the fabric where this VM is allowed and designated to run. So a very common question I get is, well, Jeff, if you're telling me this VM can only run over here, what about, what about replication? What if this site burns down? I'm, it sounds like I'm, I'm in real big trouble. No, not at all. When you configure the VM for shielded VMs, you can specify multiple fabrics. You can say you can run on site one at contoso.com and you can also run at site two. So if site one does burn down, you need to bring it up on site two, no problem, you can do that and it'll just work. But if a bad guy walks in, and again, logged in as full admin, plugs in his USB key without anybody looking, copy it onto his USB stick and takes it home, guess what? He plugs into his machine. The first thing is the shielded virtual machine comes up, looks down at the hardware and says, are you part of Contoso.com? And it turns out it'll find out it's not. Now you may be thinking, well, how does it know about the fabric? Well, there's one other piece of this puzzle. It's called the Guardian service. The Guardian service is new to 2016. And the Guardian service is what actually measures this hardware as it boots up and turns on. So if I've got a rack of servers here running Contoso.com, and this is my virtualization, when it turns on, we're actually measuring the entire boot process. We're attesting the entire boot process. Measuring, booting, hashing, all of that. We're making sure that nothing has gotten in the boot process. When it's actually booted up, guess what we do? We actually run a code integrity policy. We also have whitelisting. So what if some bad guy tries to put some malware on there? We'll detect that. Or more importantly, we won't even let you. We'll actually say, sorry, you can't even install new software on here until it is uh, compliant with the new code integrity policy. So we've locked all of those doors. Finally, the biggest door, probably one of the most challenging doors to lock, is memory. If you're an admin, you know that by definition, I can look at all of the memory in here as well. Okay, this is probably the root of the biggest challenges with how do you protect from a host admin. Because by definition, I've had people come up to me all the time and say, Jeff, put a TPM in the virtual machine and I'll encrypt it and I'll run it on the server and you'll never know it's there. And my answer has always been, that's a cute idea except it doesn't work. Because the moment you have to run that VM, I can find the keys in memory. Wow, yeah, because I'm the host admin. Guess what, we solved that one too. That one was a big one. It uses a brand new technology called virtualization-based security, which means, in essence, the keys are never in host memory, meaning even if I'm the full admin, can't find it. Finally, we also prevent debuggers from being attached. 
So even if a bad guy tries to put a, attach in a debugger to try and break in and do something, sorry, we'll detect that, and we know that this is an unhealthy host. So again, I could spend hours just talking about shielded VMs. My point being is, we have delivered something radically new, radically different, radically secure. And there is no other virtualization platform on the market that comes even remotely close to this. This is something we have been working on literally for years. And on, what's funny about this is we've been working at it from two sides, from the server side as well as the Azure side. Here's why Azure wants it. Azure wants to be able to say, if you guys want to deploy a VM and you want to shield it, Great, we can run the VM, but even Microsoft can't look inside it. Guess what? We actually have partners, hosting partners in the UK that are doing this right now. I was in London a few months ago, the day we launched Server 2016, and they announced it. They said, we are running Hyper-V VMs that are shielded, and guess what? We can't get inside them as well. We're the, they were the only hoster on earth that offered this. Very excited about this. And in the server side, the reason why we've been working on this is because we want to get, help protect against organizations that have so many admins that, you know what, they want to be able to lock down specific workloads like domain controllers are a perfect example of a workload that should be shielded. Certificate servers, another one. So fantastic technology, truly innovative technology being delivered in Server 2016. All right, I'm going to keep moving along. Software defined. Here, we made a whole bunch of massive investments. And this is where the work that we're doing in Azure, you just get for free. So, when it comes to limits, we raise the bar beyond anyone else in the industry. We support the largest physical servers known to man today shipping at all. 24 terabytes of RAM, not disk, RAM per physical server. That's in 2016. Up to 512 logical processors per physical server. And from a virtualization standpoint, the biggest, baddest monster VMs known to man, I call it Gogeta, 12 terabytes of RAM per virtual machine, the biggest, and 240 virtual processors per VM. And by the way, I should point out, not only is this in Windows Server 2016 data center, not only is this in Windows Server 2016 standard, this is also in our 100% absolutely free Microsoft Hyper-V server. Good luck getting anything even remotely close lot from that from the guys over at VMware. Finally, networking. Oh my goodness, networking. When it comes to networking, a lot of people come to me and they say, Jeff, I see all of these really awesome resources in Azure. I see application gateways, I see networking routers, I see, um, um, I see a network controller, I see distributed load balancers, I see uh, firewalls, all of these cool capabilities up in Azure. I notice that these things don't exist in Windows Server on-premises. Is this kind of your way to force me up to Azure because you're not gonna put these on-premises? And my answer's always been, no, we just haven't had the time to bring this on-premises yet. Well, surprise, 2016, we added a ton of this on premises. Now we already had network virtualization. We've actually had that for a number of releases. But what we added was the Azure data plane. That is the same data plane that we are running Azure, you get on premises. Network controller, software load balancer, distributed firewall, uh, networking for VMs and containers, RDMA optimized and micro segmentation, another great security tool. All of this is simply built in to what we've been doing in Server 2016. All of this inspired by what we're doing in Azure, wanting to bring this on premises so you can take advantage of it there as well. What's great about this is it's, and, and SDN is, is kind of challenging. It's kind of hard to explain to people SDN. It can get very abstract very quickly. It's not like a VM where you can fire up a VM and you see it and you're doing something. It's, this is bits on the wire and it's hard to explain it. But there's some very tangible benefits, and this is a perfect example. Talking to our, our friends over at Convergent, the ability to spin up a software-defined network in about eight minutes while eliminating a $20,000 cost, $20, cost is a huge benefit. And I forgot to include the rest of the quote on here. The rest of the quote is, I asked him, by the way, how long did it used to spin, take you to spin up networks? He said, oh yeah, it used to take two weeks to do this. This is eight minutes. Yeah, this is awesome. This goes back to that agility, 
you, we want you moving faster. You shouldn't be spending time on infrastructure. You should be spending time on applications and growing your business and focusing on what your customers need. Not, how do I make the infrastructure run better or faster? Next, we get to storage. In storage, honestly, we've been making huge investments starting way back in 2012. With our scale-out file server, the work we've been doing in SMB3, the work we've been doing with RDMA, with the work we've been doing in cluster shared volumes, just radical investments we've been making in storage. But the other thing is we also took a big cue from what's been going on in Azure, as well as listening to what's going on in the industry around different types of storage models. For example, Azure-inspired SDS. So, Storage Spaces Direct. With Storage Spaces Direct, we're using RDMA, Remote Direct Memory Access, to, speak, to communicate very quickly line rate to storage. Now, this may not sound important, and I'll explain why it's important in just a moment. Storage Replica. We're adding storage replication now as part of the platform. One very interesting thing. Long, long ago, when we, when, when, when people were, look, were doing, looking at replication, and the, the model for the longest time has been SANS, what would happen? You'd go to your vendor and you'd say, I want to do replication. And your so SAN vendor would put the phone on mute for just a second and do a little dance. And then he'd unmute it and say, okay, let me help you out. And here's why they would do the little dance. Because number one, you'd, you'd have to buy a SAN for site one. Then they knew they had you for site two because they had to be the same. So it really wasn't a 1x storage, it was a 2x. So they'd sell you this and then they'd sell you this and they'd say, oh, by the way, that replication software in the middle, you gotta pay for that too. And it got really expensive really quickly. Well, in 2012, way back when, we said, well, guess what? We can do this with the scale out file server. So you could just literally set up servers. But that replication software in the middle actually in many cases cost more than all of the Windows server you were paying for this one piece of software. We said, this is crazy. So you know what? We said, we're gonna include that too. Now, the nice thing about Storage Replica is if you still have SANS, great. You can use Storage Replica with SANS. You can use Storage Replica with file servers. You can use Storage Replica with NAS. In fact, Storage Replica, I could literally have a single server with spinning disks and another single server with spinning disks and actually use storage replica that low. So all of a sudden we can scale down to single server nodes. Or if you wanted a single server to replicate to a SAN or to a scale out file server, so it's incredibly flexible. That's one of the beautiful things about storage replica. It works with disks, it works with volumes, it works with SANs, it works with file servers, you name it. That's all built in as well. Storage quas, RDMA optimized, and hyper-converged optimized. Hyperconverge. So any of you looking at hyperconverge, any of you interested in hyperconverge? Mm, I see some hands. How many of you don't even know what hyperconverged is? Are you? Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Good. For those of you don't know, don't know, don't worry about it. It is the buzzword du jour, so let me explain to you what it is. Um, hyperconverged, like many of the buzzwords, um, if you deploy it, um, your hair will grow back more lustrous than ever, your children will be happier, your car will get better gas mileage, that's what hyperconverged will do. Okay, so now let me get serious for just a second. So what is hyperconverged? So hyperconverge is essentially saying, we are gonna take four servers, and on each one of those servers, we're gonna run a hypervisor, and we're gonna run our storage, okay? Now, Traditionally, we've done disaggregated approaches where we have compute and storage separately. People have said, no, no, we wanna slam these together and do hyperconverge. So let me explain to you the pros and cons of both because actually these are really cool, both of these. You just need to understand when and why you would use one over the other. Hyperconverged, so for example, four nodes, eight nodes. I like these for small to medium deployments. If you wanna do four nodes, eight nodes, 12 nodes, cool, go hyper-converged, okay? You basically take a server, you fill it with some RAM, you fill it with some storage, and then you plug these together all with Ethernet. Cool. Now, there are some challenges to hyper-converged. What happens when you realize that you bought four nodes and six months later or eight months later, you realize, whoops, I'm low on just storage or I'm low on just compute. Can you add a server that just had disks? Oh, good Lord, no. No, no, see, once you deploy hyper-converged, every one of those servers has to be the same. Because once you add a server that's different, 
good luck trying to scale this in any consistent way. The whole goal of hyperconverge is every one of these is same, so scaling is pretty simple, okay? So it's good for small, medium deployments. Um, if you need to go larger than that, beyond that, you need to do 30 node, 32, 64, 100, 500, 1,000 nodes, you're gonna, you're gonna move to something like this. This looks more like what we do in Azure here, okay? Where you have separate nodes for compute, and you have separate nodes for storage. And let me point out, these are all x86 servers. These are standard x86 servers, okay? This just happens to be running at Hyper-V. This is running our scale-out file server. Now, there's a pretty big implicit um, reason to go with the disaggregated approach. And the reason why is you can scale each one of these individually. If you deploy this, and you know what, you realize, oh, you know what, I need more compute. Okay, you can plug in another server with more compute and more memory, and guess what, now you can run more VMs. Most likely, that's not your limiting factor. Maybe you're running low on capacity and really need to add some more storage. Or you need to add some more I.O. because you're running something that's credibly I.O. bound and you need to do that, great, so add some servers down here. This allows you to scale up and down these individually. That's the beauty of going with a disaggregated approach. But again, both of them very, very useful. Again, hyperconverge, really cool for you know, these configurations where it's like, no, no, I just need that little thing over there. Now, I mentioned storage spaces direct and I mentioned RDMA a couple times. Um, real quickly, here's why this is important. So, in the world of hyperconverged, what happens is you're running a VM on node one. Well, what happens is there's no shared storage. What happens is when you do a write here, it actually writes to two other nodes simultaneously. So it means every single write results in a write across your cluster. If I do a write on node four, it's writing to two other nodes. Now, this gets really expensive really quickly. Suppose you have one workload. Say you have some big database that all of a sudden goes completely right bound. Yeah, it's gonna start impacting your others. Oh, well the hyperconverge guy didn't tell me that. Yeah, they don't really like to talk about this. See, you don't get this for free because those writes, somebody's gotta do those writes. So you know what ends up happening is your CPU ends up doing those writes. Well, folks, this is 10 gigabit ethernet, okay? This is not gig, this is 10 gig ethernet, okay? To do all of those writes, you can easily consume two, three, even four cores on a single processor. Wait a minute, that means that if any one of those nodes went compute bound, or, or I'm sorry, storage IO bound with that many writes, I can impact the in scalability of my overall hyperconverged configuration. Yes, yes it could which is why we've made investments in this thing called RDMA and Storage Spaces Direct. With RDMA and Storage Spaces Direct, when we do those writes, they don't use the CPU. This is why this is so incredibly valuable. By the way, we're the only hypervisor that supports this so far. The other guys are still catching up on this. We delivered this back in 2012, by the way. With RDMA, I can do all those writes, no CPU impact. My databases can go right crazy, that's okay. Because RDMA, nope, there's no CPU intervention. That's why it's so important to do these fundamental things in the lowest possible levels in the kernel and, and what we've been doing in storage. So, quick demo on software-defined storage. Um, one of the things we did was, um, we've been focused very closely with uh, Intel and Microsoft, we've been partnering very closely on this. Um, on software-defined storage and, and, and storage spaces direct. And one of the things we did was we set up a 16-node failover cluster, all right? And one of the things we wanted to do was we set up 704 virtual machines running VM fleet. And by the way, VM fleet is publicly available. You can download it on GitHub yourself. It is a real workload. It is not one of these fictitious VM workloads that I see that just runs things in memory. This kills I.O. And we stuck it up on GitHub so you can actually play with it yourself and you can see, oh no, this, this really crushes I.O. This is the kind of benchmark we'd love to see more people doing, okay? So we then ran 704 VMs and we said, hey, you know what? How about we compare this to some, something in real life, in real terms, Azure, for example. So we said, like in Azure P10 VM, we fired up all 16 VMs and we ran 
with 500 IOPS, just like an Azure PT, P, P10 virtual machine. And we got 350,000 IOPS total. Sweet. By the way, I want to point out, this is 70% read, 30% write, which is very realistic. That's pretty much where you'll find most people. This isn't some 100% read thing. 70% read, 30% write. We said, no problem. In fact, this was easy peasy. We actually were using our quality of service to limit the performance. We said, okay, what if we took this another step farther? What if we wanted to make this look like, oh, I don't know, the Azure P20 VMs? Well, the Azure P20 VMs give you much more IOPS performance from that. So we reconfigured our test, ran it again, and now we're seeing, ooh, 1,600,000 IOPS total out of a 16-node cluster. 2,300 IOPS per virtual machine, and by the way, less than 6% overhead on the CPU. That's because of RDMA. Without RDMA, we'd be easily in the double digits. We said, cool. By the way, notice hypervisor time extremely low, really, really low. We said, okay, we haven't even gotten warm yet though. So let's try this again. Let's do, what would the next test look like? What if we said, hey, you know what? Let's just turn all the safeties off. Let's turn off the quality of service. How fast can we go? So what we did this time was we ran this one more time and guess what? Still with 70% read, 30% write, 2,700,000 IOPS out of 16 nodes. Still less than 10% overhead. And I can guarantee you at this point without RDMA, we'd be easily past the teens and into the 20s without RDMA. We'd be pretty much starting to really have an impact on overall scalability. Being the crazy guys that we are, we said, all right, let's take the safeties off one more time. What if we ran this test, but this time we actually made it just a read test, not just a 70%, 30% write. Uh, what if we just said 100% read? Just how fast will this thing go? We were just kind of curious. And so we reran the test one more time. And you'll see the IOPS numbers are gonna start to climb. We have 2.7 million IOPS. Uh, we have 2.78. We've got 2.8 million IOPS. We've got 2.9. We've got 3.6 million IOPS. We've got 5 million IOPS. We've got 6.3 million IOPS. We've got, yeah, 6,600,000 IOPS out of a 16 node cluster. Crazy, crazy performance out of a 16 node cluster. That's the type of performance we're talking about. And again, this is the work that we've done, the real hard work plumbing deep down to make sure all of this works to give you fantastic performance and scale. So just an idea of what we can deliver with Storage Spaces Direct. And by the way, this is only going to get faster as networks and Flash gets even faster as well. So with Windows Software Defined Storage, um, we have a bunch of partners that are doing a bunch of work here. Um, you can buy solutions from Data On, love what they've been doing. Uh, Data On has actually built this beautiful um, HTML5 interface for Storage Spaces Direct. It's beautiful. Um, Lenovo, NEC, HP, Supermicro, you can see we have a bunch of partners that are doing a whole bunch of great things with us um, with software defined storage and Storage Spaces Direct. Now I'm going to switch gears for just a moment and move into containers for just a second. I'm going to peek at my time. Oh, good, I'm not doing too bad. Containers. Quick question. How many of you are actively using containers right now in production? Anybody? Oh, two, couple hands. Okay, very cool. How many of you have heard about it and have no idea what it is? And there's no, well, okay, cool, that's all right. So it's good to get an understanding of where we are. So to give you an idea of kind of how I feel where we are, virtualization back in 2003, I felt like we were doing virtualization 101. Here's a VM, here's how you install an OS, this is what you do inside of it. Now we all just do this. I mean, it's on our laptop, it's that easy, it's everywhere. Containers, I feel like we're back having that 2003 conversation. Containers are brand new, <clears throat> containers are different, I've heard all of the different types of FUD and rhetoric there is for containers. I've heard people say straight out, VMs are dead, containers are gonna kill them. I've heard the complete opposite, VMs are better and they're gonna kill your containers. I've heard that your chocolate's in my peanut butter, no, your peanut butter's in my chocolate. It's okay, folks. Containers and VMs are gonna be shipping together 
for a very, very long time, long after I retire, and I don't plan on retiring anytime soon. They are different. They are in no way the same other than they are abstractions. It's not apples and origins, it's apples and Buicks. That's how different they are. Let me explain, and once you hear the history, it may start to make a little more sense. So remember, 2003, virtualization, eh, it's, in the, it's early on. 2005, we're starting to really start cooking a little bit more. 2007, 2008, we're cooking with gas now. All right, everybody's doing this. Virtualization is happening. IT, you guys creating VMs, deploying VMs, all is good. It's becoming standard fare. So what happens? With virtual machines, what do we do? With a VM, we actually make what looks like a physical piece of hardware into software. It's got a virtual motherboard, it's got virtual storage, it's got virtual processors, NICs, uh, memory, all of these things, and we make it look like physical hardware so that you can install an operating system inside of it. Whether it's Windows, DOS, Linux, Red Hat, client, server, you name it, and just install it and it works. Okay, that's the goal of a VM, but we're doing it at the machine level. Now what happened was, as we were doing this, developers have been writing their apps. Developer writes an app and it's 10 megabytes, let's say. You got a team working on a bunch of apps and it's 10 megabytes. They would hand this application to IT. IT would stick it in a VM and give it back to the developer and the developer now has 10 gigabytes. D developer goes, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not understanding what happened here. I gave you a 10 megabyte file and you gave me back 10 gigabytes. And IT said, well, yeah, this is how we deploy VMs. This is how we deploy apps. Ooh, let's not do that. This is how we deploy VMs. This is how we deploy apps. This is how we work. Developer said, yeah, that's cool. I get it, and that works for you. But I don't want 10 gigabytes. I just want my app. And IT said, yeah, but that's how we do it. So they said, OK, fine. You know what? We're going to go off in our little world in developer land, and we're going to look at this problem. You guys keep deploying VMs. So what did they do? They said, I don't want an abstraction that gives me all of that. They said, you know what? Let's abstract a little bit higher. So you can think of containers really as operating system virtualization or OS virtualization. And what's happening is with containers, you deploy a container and it's calling down to a kernel, a kernel that's actually shared by all of the other containers. Now, containers are isolated in the fact that they can't see each other. When you fire up a container and say, show me the file system, it thinks it's the only thing on the server. If I fire up 20 containers, they all think they're the only thing running. They don't know about anything else. They all think they have a brand new operating system. Think about when you buy a brand new device, Surface, laptop, whatever, and you turn it on for the very first time and you log in and you go to C colon backslash, you see like, what, 10 directories? System, program files, et cetera. That's what a container sees every time it turns on. It sees a pristine file system. And then they add whatever files or directories it needs. So containers put literally everything they need inside the container. So frameworks, DLL, shared libraries, everything, and they put it in this image file, and they say, Instead of running an installer, because we're all used to running MSIs, what do you do? Oh, I need to install this thing. You double click on an MSI and you run it. In a container, you don't do any of that. There's no double click on a container and run a container. You say, no, Docker run container. Guess what starts running? You didn't run an installer. And guess what? It didn't actually write anything to the operating system. Okay? When you fire up an MSI, what happens? When you double click on an MSI, it sprays things everywhere in the registry, creates new directories, does all of these things to the operating system, and you go, oh my gosh, who knows even where it put everything? Container says, nope, everything's self-contained, Docker run container, go. So, guess what? Developers love these. Developers, I, I write a container, I give it to IT, I see IT deploy, they say Docker run container, everything's fantastic. So my app, container version one. I deploy it, everything is great. 10 minutes later, my developer says, whoops, <laughs> I left in some debugging code, silly me. Let me give you version 1.1. Here you go, here's the new container. Guess what? IT says, okay, let me turn off container one, stick it in the library, and let me turn on container 1.1. Guess what? 
There was no uninstaller, there was no installer. It was literally Docker run container, go. Just magically worked. Wow, this is awesome. Okay, guess what? This is why containers are really cool. Because developers can give you containers as fast as you can accept them, you run them and you go. Now, they're not perfect. So what happened was, we were talking to these guys as we've been developing containers for Windows, and um, we went to these guys, and in fact, we actually spoke to, again, like we do a lot of work in the security field, I spoke to a bunch of guys who do security audits. And I said to them, hey guys, Quick question for you. You know, we do common criteria every year for virtualization. These containers, they're really hot. What do you think of containers? And they're like, oh yeah, Jeff, yeah, we hate those. I, I said, what? I said, oh yeah, we hate those. You are absolutely gonna fail any criteria audit you, you try and run with, with the container. It's, you will absolutely fail. And I said, what? And he said, Jeff, they're all sharing a kernel. If you're doing security, you never use the words shared and kernel in the same sentence. Sorry, you're gonna fail big time. So we, we went back to the open source guys and we said, guys, guys, help us understand. You're all gonna fail your audits. What are you doing to solve this problem? They said, oh, we're putting them in VMs. <laughs> Wait a minute. Why did we do containers in the first place? To not use a VM. My head hurts, guys. Okay, so here's what we did. We said, fine, we're gonna create two types of containers. The first one is a Windows Server container. It looks just like an open source Linux Docker container, okay? By the way, Docker, love those guys. They make great tools. Just so you know, Docker actually doesn't make containers. Containers are a feature of the operating system. We're the only ones that can deliver Windows Server containers. Containers are a feature of Linux. So Red Hat has containers. Fedora has, has containers. SUSE has containers. Debian, Ubuntu, everybody has containers. Docker doesn't make containers. Docker makes the tools to create containers and deploy them, and they're awesome. But it's a subtle difference. So we said, Windows Server containers. We will create these, and guess what? They share the kernel just like the open source guys. Okay, we'll do that, done, in the box. We're also gonna create a second type of container called a Hyper-V container. Guess what? These are secure and isolated. Ah, oh, now we're cooking with gas. So here's the difference. You tell your developer, create a container. Now it doesn't matter what kind of container he's creating because it's the same. Windows Server containers and Hyper-V containers, and this is an important note, are exactly the same. You tell your developer, create a container. At runtime, when you deploy the container, IT, you say, hmm, is this a Hyper-V container or a Windows Server container? Think of it as checking a checkbox. You get to determine at runtime. Developer, you don't change anything you do. Use all of your Docker tools. All of your Docker tools just work with Windows containers, literally out of the box. At runtime, you say, is this a Hyper-V container or Windows Server container? Now, you may be thinking, hmm, when would I use one or the other? If I'm in a public cloud where I don't know who the other folks are on the server, absolutely use Hyper-V containers. If you're in a compliance regulatory world, if you're in a financial, if you are in healthcare, oh please, if you're in financial in healthcare, just use this. If you're in test dev, or if you're in your own enterprise and you know everybody else in the server, in, in the, that's running on the server, use either one of them, I don't care. The important thing to understand is this one, each one of these containers has its own isolated kernel. There is no shared kernel and you will pass the audit with flying colors. You just say, we're running Hyper-V containers everywhere. Here's my seal of approval. All is good. There's also a secondary benefit to this. When you're running Windows Server containers or Linux containers for that matter, when you update the kernel, by the way, you just updated the kernel for all of the containers run top, running on top of that. Ooh, wait a minute, what? So imagine somebody just came in and just started updating kernels for all of your apps and didn't tell you. Would you be cool with that? Don't think so. Your app developers are gonna say, no, 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 we wanna test the new kernel, make sure nothing got broken. Okay, well with Hyper-V containers, you can actually 
determine when you update these kernels. You can actually put them on their own schedule. So it gives you that flexibility as well around patch management. So it's an important thing to understand about containers. So finally, you may be thinking, what do I run in a container? Am I running like Exchange or Full SQL or Full SharePoint? No. If you got Full SQL, Full SharePoint, Full Exchange, guess what? Those continue to run in VMs. Nano Server is a new minimal footprint operating system. It has two roles. Number one, it's perfect for containers. In a container, you want a super lightweight operating system to run your web app. Maybe I want to run a .NET and ASP.NET. Maybe I want to run some Node applications. Great, those run great on Nano Server in a container, and they're super small and isolated. Nano Server is also perfect to run on your hardware. So for example, I'm going to deploy a brand new 16 node cluster for Hyper-V. Guess what? Nano is perfect for it. And here's why. Full server. Windows Server, by the way, ships in three deployment options. Full Windows Server, okay? The whole enchilada. I mean, browser, Internet Explorer, shell, GUI, all of that stuff. 10 plus gigabytes on disk. Big. That's what it does. Server core, smaller, about five gigs. Still pretty big, too big for a container. Nano server, listen to me carefully, 400 megabytes. For you, for you youngins in the room who don't know what that word is, a megabyte is smaller than a gigabyte. You probably haven't heard that term used in a long time with operating systems. It's really small. So nano server, 400 megabytes, um, boot time, literally nine seconds, setup, um, I mean literally from this machine is bare with nothing on it to complete boot up 35 seconds. It's crazy fast, okay? It's ideal for running your Hyper-V hosts. It's ideal for running your storage spaces, your file servers, your, 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 your uh, storage spaces direct on it, your, your scale out file server. It's also ideal for containers. That's why we've delivered nano server. And then finally, from a management standpoint, um, I talked about a bunch of this already today, so I'm not going to spend too much of it. If you saw this in the keynote, um, talked about operations management suite and the fact that it can deliver hybrid management capabilities and, more importantly, intelligence back to you. To me, I, I mean, I've been talking to folks like yourself for you know, over four, almost 14 years here at Microsoft. IT professionals who every year tell me the same thing. Jeff, I'm taxed to do more with less less budget, less hardware, less people, what do you, how can you help me? This is a perfect example. Operations management suite is actually actively, think of it as having people on your team basically saying, look, we just ran a SQL assessment and there's some things we could do to shore up your SQL, to give you better perf, to give you better scale, to help your security. Same thing for your active directory. We used to do things like best practices analyzers, okay? Guess what? Those are really cool, but the problem is with the best practice analyzer, we'd ship it, and then when would we rev it? This is literally live. We can make changes any time, and guess what we do? If we see, guess what, there's some brand new anti-malware that we actually just discovered, and we are, are now seeing it in, let's say, oh, I don't know, Russia, guess what? We now can take that, 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 that signature, we can include it, in our intelligence heuristics and help you find it before it actually gets inside your infrastructure or as it's trying to get in your infrastructure. So think of it as helping you do more with less um, and providing the intelligence of the cloud. Automation and control um, through operations management suite. Security and compliance, again, security domains, anti-malware assessments, network and security, baseline assessments, threat intelligence, where we are literally using the power of our Microsoft Cloud to tell you, hey, guess what? We're seeing a rash of attacks over here. We're seeing a rash of attacks here in your organization right now. Oh, let's get on this right now. Let's not wait about this later, and let's avoid anybody from being on the front page of the news about what you can do to make your organization run better. Um, protection and recovery, site recovery, backup, all of these things to provide you that peace of mind that you're looking for. And again, um, the innovation that we're doing up in the cloud is incredibly fast. This is the first half of 2016. 
Just look at all of these new capabilities that we simply added. Guess what, these just appeared, gave you new capabilities and new features that you could take advantage of. And, and this, this innovation is a constant stream um, coming from what we're doing um, in our public cloud and again, allowing you to do better in hybrid scenarios. Um, finally, the cloud journey. A whole bunch of these things are also available publicly. I want you to be able, you know, if you're thinking, man, I wish, I wish I'd brought my team with me. I wish there were more people in my organization that knew about what Jeff was talking about. Okay, guess what? You guys are gonna get these slides, by the way, but please take all the pictures you want. Okay, this is publicly available sessions from Ignite, from folks like myself, other my colleagues that are talking about this, walking through, doing demos as well, that you can better understand what we're doing for compute, networking, storage management, hardware, and so much more. So with that, I just wanna say thank you guys so very much. Really appreciate your time here in Chicago, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the time here at the Tech Summit. Thank you very much.